I'm Rick Sending. It's March 8th, 2013, here at the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers University, interviewing Carl Van Horn for the Center on the American Governor. Uh, Carl Van Horn, currently Professor of Public Policy here at Rutgers and Director of the Heldrich Center for Workforce Development. You were the Director of Policy in Governor Florio's administration. Uh, but before that, you had a relationship with uh, Jim Florio that dated back several years. I'm wondering if you could fill us in on how the two of you got to know each other and how your uh, uh, relationship developed over the years. Actually, we're sitting in the drawing room of the Eagleton Institute of Politics, and I think this is the first place I met him, or at least maybe the second place. And the reason we were in this room is because he uh, was interested in teaching a course at Rutgers after he lost the gubernatorial election in 1981 by landslide of whatever it was, 1,700 votes or something. Um, he was interested in uh, teaching, and he approached Alan Rosenthal, and uh, Alan and I uh, agreed to work with him, and so to help him do the course. He would come here Monday morning, we'd have breakfast with him in a local hotel, and uh, the idea, of course, is we were going to teach it together. In fact, he taught the course, and we sat there and listened and learned a lot from it. So that's where I first met him. And then subsequent to that, um, we, he and I got to know each other, and I started uh, organizing uh, briefings for him in his uh, congressional office on issues facing New Jersey. Uh, of course, he was thinking about running uh, in 1986 against uh, gov in then incumbent Governor Kane. Wisely, in my view, decided not to do that. Um, and was it 86 or 85? 85, 85 yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, off-year elections. And... Um, and also at the time, uh, I, was, I had a congressional fellowship from the American Political Science Association, so I was in Washington working on the Joint Economic Committee staff, not working for him, but on a separate, obviously separate uh, group. And so we would see each other in Washington from time to time. Uh, and, but it really got more intense as we got closer to the 89 election. It was clear he was going to run. So for many, many Saturdays, I would organize meetings um, in his congressional office, bringing in different experts on topics from A to Z, uh, usually just a few people, um, and we would spend uh, several hours in the morning talking over those issues. And uh, I remember very vividly because I had two young children at the time, um, and I didn't see them very often on Saturday mornings <laughs> or for a year or two uh, going down to his office. I knew exactly how far it was um, and how long it took me to get there. But that was a very interesting process. Um, and then, of course, when he decided to run uh, I helped him somewhat during the campaign as well. Let's go back actually before your relationship with the governor and talk a little bit about your preparation and background. What's your academic background and uh, where did you get your training and your mm -hmm. education and so forth? I have a PhD in political science. Uh, went to Ohio State University. Uh, and, um, you know, I entered academia uh, when I graduated immediately. I taught at the State University of New York, Stony Brook. Uh, for a couple of years, and then I moved here to Eagleton, so I, I uh, at Rutgers. So I've been at Rutgers since 1978, uh, and so I had been at uh, Eagleton for several years. And my area of specialization is American public policy, um, and especially intergovernmental policy. Um, I've written about that, and and then and that's as a political scientist. And I'm also a public policy trained in public policy and economics, and so there. My work has been on American labor markets and workforce and education yeah. programs. Your Saturday morning meetings with, uh, with Congressman Florio, mm -hmm. uh, were they largely to just kick around different policy ideas? Were they to talk specifically about issues facing New Jersey at that time? How familiar, how um, up to date was he on state public policy issues and how much were you involved in trying to bring him up to speed on them? You know, I would describe it as I was providing him the meal and he, he was consuming it. So in other words, he was there to listen and learn. He was not on output in those meetings as much as he was on input. So I would try to identify the smartest people I knew uh, who could talk to him or wanted to talk to him. They were Republicans and Democrats and independents. And it wasn't formulating policy positions. It was learning about the policy, right? So he wanted to know what did these folks, and they weren't, what do they think? And he wasn't talking to people who were necessarily all that deeply involved in electoral politics. There were a few elected officials that would come to those meetings, because obviously there's some that are specialized in certain policy areas, but it really was academics, current or former uh, members of um, 
Kane administration or, or other gubernatorial, Burn administration, people who um, perhaps a few people from other states that had moved but that still had familiarity with New Jersey. So it was, it was a diverse uh, group of people. Now, he had some specialization himself while he was in Congress, uh, certainly in environmental areas, also in health care, and uh, he was on the Commerce and Transportation Committees. Right, right. Uh, were those, did you focus in on other areas that perhaps he wasn't as involved in, or did you also touch on many of them? Well, we touched less on them. I, I, think, I think he was uh, certainly keenly interested in education policy um, and um, the various court decisions that were evolving. He, you know, we spent a lot of time on that, um, and also fiscal policy vis-a-vis -vis New Jersey. But he, we, did, we did some of the, for example, in transportation, he, we, we, I remember we had some briefings on that, certainly environmental policy vis-a-vis -vis the state of New Jersey. So it was not that he was unfamiliar with those issues, but he wanted to know more. And um, generally speaking, my role in that was to, as I said, set the table, um, guide the discussion, sense when it was time to excuse ourselves and let him go on to something else. But um, he was very interested in those meetings. And uh, they, um, I, of course, at that point had met a number of elected officials. There were few that I had met that were that intensely interested in policy just for its own sake and how it was evolving. And I also gave him a few things to read in advance. And, and uh, again, unlike many people, he'd actually read them and he was prepared. Just um, maybe for, before we move ahead to the 89 election, um, can you give me an example of the, uh, uh, maybe even by name, of the kinds of people that you brought in for, let's say, an education discussion? Who, whom would you have brought in to meet with uh, then Congressman Jim Florio to talk about education policy in New Jersey? Well, Tom Corcoran, for example, who was an education policy expert and wound up working for him as one of his key advisors on education policy. Um, Susan Furman, who is a professor here at, at uh, the Eagle Institute, is now the president of the Teachers College of Columbia. Uh, folks like that, and uh, other folks from you know who were involved in the issue. Environment, for example, Mike Catania, you know, who mm -hmm. was the deputy commissioner, I guess, of DEP or something like that at the time. I don't remember. Um, and uh, people who were involved in uh, advocacy organizations who had a policy expertise. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, were, there was a long list of people. And uh, state planning was another issue, actually, come to think of it, which, of course, cuts across environment and, and urban development and so on. And uh, that was a very um, uh, prominent issue back then. Uh, and he was very interested in that. So we, we had folks talk about that. My wife was one of those individuals. She was uh, the founding director of New Jersey Future, so she uh, briefed him on what was going on with that. Uh, so they should point out that New Jersey Future is an organization that advocates for state planning. Exactly, right. And it's a bipartisan, non, you know, nonpartisan organization. So, as I said, it wasn't just people who had, um, and it certainly wasn't people who were just looking for a job, you know, in the administration. I, if Although you, there if must have been want. some of those as well. well of course, <laughs> of course. But it wasn't just that. There were many people who were independent of that. I, I, I know that... Uh, Dick Leone, who, of course, was a prominent uh, person in the Burn administration, treasurer, uh, member at that time of, of the Port Authority Board, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, uh, he briefed them on what was going on with the Port Authority. Um, so there were some specialized briefings and, and then some broader issue briefings. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get into the 1989 gubernatorial election. Were you on staff of the campaign? You were, you were, a, you were an advisor to the campaign. Yeah, very informally. I mean, I, I was... Uh, you know, I, I helped, I looked at some issue papers that, that the staff drafted. Um, I, I may have written some myself, but I was not um, not day to day. I certainly wasn't on the staff. I probably went to the campaign headquarters in West Orange two or three times. I, I met him occasionally uh, in different parts of the state that he would like to talk about an issue, um, but I certainly was not deeply involved in the campaign. There came a time probably, I would say, September of 1989, when it became pretty clear that uh, Florio was going to win the gubernatorial election. It was at that time that he brought Steve Persky on to the campaign, and he was widely viewed as being the person who was going to sort of begin to oversee the transition from campaign to uh, actual governing. Mm -hmm. At what point did you begin to start thinking less along the lines of how do I uh, advise a candidate running for office 
to how do I begin to advise a person who looks as though he's going to be the next governor? Well, actually, I remember pretty well what happened. He was give, Governor Congressman Foyer was giving a, a speech in Cherry Hill. I don't remember the exact date. He asked me to come and meet with him after the speech. So I went down to meet with him. And what he said to me is he said, would you be interested in working in the administration if I were to win? And I said, I'd be honored to do that. He said, well, then I want you to meet with Steve Persky. Go to Atlantic City. Here's his phone number. Steve will expect to hear from you. Um, and I did. <laughs> I didn't bother. To, the governor was surrounded by other people. I think there must have been 25 people waiting to talk to him. So this was sort of in a rather public place. So needless to say, I didn't explore what he meant by working for him anything in that context. But I uh, was, of course, I was interested. I, I was making no commitment. I was just interested. So I went down and met with Steve. Steve began telling me what he was doing. Steve told me that um, more or less one way or the other, Congressman Florio, if he wins, wants you as part of his team. Uh, I want you to think about that. Um, we'll work out the details later. Um, and, you know, go back and think about that and talk with your wife and talk with your colleagues and, you know, but be very limited in the number of people you talk to about this. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's basically what happened. And um, uh, so I thought about it and I uh, thought this is a terrific opportunity for somebody who is, uh, teaches about government and policy, helps educate young people to go into the profession. Um, you know, and I, of course, admired the uh, congressman, so I said, well, I'll try to work it out. Okay, and you did work it out. I did. How long did it take to work that out? At what point were you actually offered a job? And, and the specific job of director of policy? It, it, it evolved. Um, what happened was that um, the, the transition office was established. I was probably there the second day or the first day. Um, and, um, you know, we didn't have titles at that point. You know, it was just <laughs> throw yourself into the enterprise, as uh, um, people who watch this may or may not know. Putting together an administration is a complex task, especially after eight years of an incumbent member of the other party, Governor Kane. And I should say, by the way, I was involved in that, very involved in that transition, and Governor Kane and his people couldn't have been more gracious and helpful. Now, they didn't, in a policy sense, always do the things that, that then Governor Forio wanted them to do. But in terms of, as a, on a professional basis, they were very easy to work with. And they shared all the information that we asked for and also gave us the opportunity to meet with outgoing uh, officials. So, um, so that, we didn't have titles. But the governor-elect then started talking with folks, and Steve Persky and other people started talking with folks about, well, what role would uh, people play? Uh, and I do remember one of the interesting episodes was the governor-elect was interested in having potentially moving his office from the first floor, where the governor's office from the first floor to the second floor, so that various people could have access to him on a regular basis as opposed to the kind of little isolated experience in the governor's office, per se, the formal office. And I think he had in mind this sort of hub and spoke Roosevelt model of advising, you know, that there would be these people. And the, essentially that was nixed by a, the security people and a number of other people didn't make sense. Uh, I actually wound up occupying there. You worked up there too, so you know it wasn't perfect for a governor to be located. But um, the the point, the reason I bring that up is because what he said to me and to all of us was that that were in you know kind of the people uh, that were going to work most closely with him was he said. I don't know what your titles are going to be, but I just I want you around me and I, I want you involved and I want you to have access to me and we'll work out the details. We'll, we'll get in a minute to who that group of people uh, mm -hmm. was, um, but uh, there's one thing I want to focus on in terms of the campaign, the transition, sure. and then the earliest days in office. Um, the governor in his own interviews um, 20 years, 30, 25 years after the fact, uh, talks a lot about the fact that during the campaign uh, he was led to believe that there was going to be a budget surplus and it wasn't until uh, he actually uh, walked in the first day of the transition and was briefed by the Kane people to find out that there was in fact a looming substantial deficit. Yeah. Um, I distinctly remember pundits at the time, and I was one of them, uh, being asked what we thought was going to happen in the 1989 gubernatorial election. And, and, and I remember saying at the time, 
There are two things that are absolutely certain. One is that the next governor of New Jersey is going to be a former congressman named Jim. Uh, and the other is that one of the first things he's going to do is raise taxes. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was, it was an open secret in, uh, among the, 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 the people who followed politics and government closely in 1989 that there was going to be a substantial pressure on the incoming governor to raise taxes because of a looming deficit. Now, did, did you all really not know that there was going to be this looming deficit and just took the, the previous administration at its word throughout the campaign? Or did you have a hunch that once you came in, you were going to have to face this difficult economic circumstance? Well, there's a difference between a hunch and the and understanding the magnitude of a problem. And I think that's probably what the governor's referring to. Uh, it was larger than most that we anticipated. Um, and it may have been larger than Governor Kane and his people anticipated. We have no way of knowing that, right? Um, and I certainly don't have a, rec a recollection 25 years later whether, you know, but it, it was... Um, it was certainly uh, larger than we thought. Um, and um, it meant that, uh, and the other thing is, I, it's important to point out, that when you pivot from a campaign to governing, you know, which was my interest, I was frankly not as interested. I'm not an electioneer or a campaign person. So uh, when you go to governing, a whole sets of other questions arise. Um, we had to think about uh, many other crises, not just the possibility of a fiscal one. So uh, it was on top of that, um, if you will, that the challenges seem rather steep. But I, I must say that these challenges are usually difficult, uh, especially when there's a party change, and especially when someone's been in office for a long time. With 2020 hindsight, uh, had Jim Florio run not saying that he saw no need to raise taxes in the campaign, but being a little more cagey on that subject? Um, might he have won by 300,000 votes instead of 700,000 votes? And might his administration have been somewhat different in terms of preparing people for the likelihood that there would be tax increases? Perhaps, but I'm, I'm not an electoral analyst, so I don't know. Okay. I really don't. I mean, you know, that, of course, pundits talked about that. And, uh, you know, I, I wasn't in charge of messaging in the campaign, so mm -hmm. I'll leave that to others that will be interviewed in this project to talk about uh, that. They certainly will. Um, all right, we're, 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 we're now uh, late 1989, early 1990. You're coming into office. You've been named as the director of policy. One of the interesting elements of the early part of the Florida administration is that you and Brenda Bacon essentially shared a title. Mm -hmm. uh, the Office of Policy and Planning changed to the Office of Management and Planning. You were the Director of Policy. I don't exactly recall what Brenda's title was, but it was sort of understood she that this was She was Chief this... of Management and Planning, as okay. I recall. Right. But, but that, there were, that, that the two of you essentially presided over this Office of Management and Planning. How did you distinguish between what her portfolio was and what yours Well, there's was? also another element, Rick, and that is that Greg Lawler was named Chief Counsel for legislation and policy, I believe is his title, okay? As opposed to counsel of the governor, and he was also and that was in the a different of management and planning. Exactly, right. right. So, no, no, Greg was in the council's office. Greg Law was in oh, the was council's he? office. Oh, was he? Oh, I thought yes. he was in management and Right, right. Okay. So, you know, that's, I get, this gets back to the point I alluded to earlier where you know, I think the, the governor-elect and then the governor was less interested in these titles than he was interested in having the folks that he trusted to work with him, right? And, you know, so, you know, it evolved over time. Uh, at first, of course, we had to sort that out. But, for example, at the very beginning uh, of the administration, and even during the transition, some of these issues began sorting themselves out. Greg would be uh, taking the lead on insurance policy because he had staffed the governor. Mm -hmm. It's important to point out to, to uh, whoever sees this that he had been a longtime staffer at him on his congressional subcommittee, very trusted by, by Congressman and Congressman Florio, and had handled insurance and transportation and other issues for him in Washington. So he wanted Greg to come to New Jersey to work with him on those issues, so he would work on that. Uh, Brenda was uh, an expert on healthcare policy, and she is very involved in the healthcare industry uh, and in other human services, so naturally she was going to do that. Um, I had worked with him more closely on education policy, higher education, K through 12 education, uh, and other issues. So I was likely to be more involved in that. So now, not to say that other people weren't involved in those issues in different ways, but the, I think some of it evolved naturally. Um, and um, 
over time, of course, and we'll talk more about this, the, the, the governor's office changed, but at least initially that was what happened. And, and also, I think this is true in any administration, there's a sorting out process. You can give people whatever title you want, but then you things work in terms of a crisis, an issue that gets assigned to you. Uh, and like most governors, um, I think, um, that I know, uh, he was open to different points of view from his staff. So it's not like a single person was entirely responsible for that. Now, obviously, the cabinet members, you know, the treasurer was very important. Other people, the chief of staff, other people were weighing in on these issues. So even if you were, in a sense, the lead on an issue, you were still dealing with lots of other people. And he was getting the opinions of lots of other folks. You mentioned the, the cabinet officers, and I want to focus a little bit on, on how the cabinet was chosen and, mm -hmm. and who was involved in making those decisions. Um, you and Steve Persky, uh, I guess, and Brenda Bacon, Greg Lawler, um, were, were certainly the closest people to Jim Florio during the time that he was making the transi transition. I guess John Schuer was also involved mm -hmm. at that level. How much input... And Doug Berman, too. And Doug Berman, of course, Doug Berman. Um, yeah, and we'll get more to him later. Sure. Um, how involved were all of you in helping the governor choose the cabinet? Uh, or how much did he participate in the actual decision-making process of who would, who would make up his cabinet? But before I forget, let me make sure for the record, Karen Kessler was very involved too. Karen uh, had been uh, the head of uh, fundraising for the governor, mm -hmm. a very smart person, management uh, experience background. So she also played a very important role, as did, as did others. But anyway, to answer your question, the, um, it varied depending on the, the office. And, um, you know, I think that, um, I think the governor had in mind some people he didn't need any help to vet candidates. So Bob, uh, Robert Del Tufo was a person that he had great respect for and wanted him to be attorney general. I think he was the first appointee, as I recall. Probably, so, and, and yeah. that maybe Doug was the first or second. But at any rate, um, the, the, the attorney general is a constitutional office, meaning that you know once you're appointed, you can't, you can't be dismissed except for cause. Um, so that's a careful decision the governor makes, an important decision. Um, there were other people, uh, the transportation position, for example, who there were some candidates inside the state, but the governor wanted a broader, governor like wanted a broader scope. Um, and so uh, an individual from out of state, Tom Downs, was recruited. Uh, but, you know, I participated in many of those interviews, as did other people. So it depended on the situation. There were some folks he knew for sure and other folks he didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and, for example, I think in selecting the... Uh, uh, the health commissioner and the human services commissioner, I would say Brenda was the most important person. Uh, you know, so I think it depended very much on the... And on education? This. Were you actively involved in I that? was involved, yeah. but there were lots of people involved in that. That was, um, there were many people who were interviewed, I mean, many, if several, mm -hmm. uh, and... Um, and you ended up getting a man from Texas. Exactly, right. And, and of course, the governor would usually interview... Um, on those sort of, in a sense, open seats, if you will, the ones he didn't know in advance, he would he would interview a few people, and of course he made the final decision. Mm -hmm. I, I think leading this all overall, I would say my recollection was really it was Steve Persky's role to really guide that. Uh, in other words, he was the person who, for example, would review the confidential reports from the state police, um, which is a very important issue. Uh, it's known as the four-way check, which is just has to do with uh, um, the three databases about your background plus some personal interviews. Uh, and um, there were some people, which I will not talk about, who were ruled out because of that. So they would never have gotten to the governor-elect, right? That Those candidates, in the sense of, would just be ruled out to begin with. There weren't many people, but there were a couple where there were some questionable issues that um, really didn't they wouldn't merit a, a position in a cabinet in a Florida administration. Um, but, um, but I think Steve was really the sort of, he was the principal person managing that process, and I think that was that as well as the, the sort of the key legislative initiatives and so on. That was kind of his job is to get, was to get that done and to serve the governor, um, especially for those people where the governor wasn't sure who he wanted to hire. Mm -hmm. Once the cabinet was in place, um, one of the 
criticisms of the Florio administration in its early going. Uh, and, I, and I think this is probably true of most administrations in the first few months of activity, uh, is that there were really a handful of people around the governor uh, who reserved unto themselves the right to really make virtually all of the important decisions. And uh, I know in speaking with some cabinet officers at the time, uh, they felt left out. Um, other people uh, who f thought that they would have better access uh, felt left out. Um, is that something that's just symptomatic of the early days of an administration? Do you think that the criticism of the early days of the Florida administration are accurate? Um, or would you say that uh, uh, there are particular reasons why it has to be as closely yeah. knit as it was? Well, as they say, where you depend, stand depends on where you sit. So, yeah, I'm giving you my, my perspective. First of all, I would say the governor made all the important decisions. You know, one of the things that I, I, I reject the idea that the staff made these decisions. Okay. okay. Um, and I think we all knew that, and that's probably why he trusted us, because he didn't expect us to be freelancing. Uh, and that doesn't mean there weren't smaller choices that were made that he didn't necessarily have to be brought into or needed or wanted to be brought into. But I, 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 there were just not very many important decisions that he wasn't intimately involved in. First of all, he, he read voluminous briefing materials from the staff. And David Applebaum, who we haven't mentioned, was a person who was orga you know, organized all that to get to him. Uh, and Tina Lotto, who is his personal secretary. So he read, he met, you know, he made those decisions. It, from the standpoint of the cabinet, you know, if I was in those shoes, their shoes, um, A, I guess I would have not been surprised by the fact that these key people that he knew very well were going to be very influential in the governor's office. So if they were surprised, that's, they shouldn't have been. Mm -hmm. And secondly, if I was a cabinet member, I probably would have been nonetheless wishing I had more access, right? Because there's nothing like personal access to uh, to state your case directly to the governor. And some of them were, didn't have that. They, so they were really, uh, and I can't remember exactly who falls into which category, but there were clearly people who made, needed no appointment to meet with the governor. Bob Del Tufo, Doug Berman, they, they just called in and said, I have to see the governor, or called them, and that was it. There were other cabinet officers who would have to go through a staff person, the governor's assistant, or one of us on the senior staff, to say, I'd, I'd like to meet with the governor, and often they wouldn't really be given the opportunity to meet with him alone. So if I were in their shoes, you know, I'd say, gee, I wish I could meet with them uh, without these other people involved. But whether that's, uh, you know, I, I suspect that's part of any, when there's a chief executive, a principal, the person who is the real decision maker, that people jealously guard, you know, they want that access, they want the ability to have unfettered access. Having said that, it's unrealistic for that to happen because of his schedule, or his or her schedule, whoever the governor is, and given the way New Jersey politics is, there's so many lines of decision making come into that person that you couldn't allow the whole cabinet just to walk in when anything any, any they wanted. And some people, if you gave them that, would have probably uh, abused that privilege, let's put it that way. And I, I don't, I think the staff was also very sensitive to that too, that uh, you know, you just didn't walk down there and, you know, it, it had to be an imminent dis issue or decision. Uh, and, and again, I want to emphasize, he was, the Governor of Florida was very much a paper, a, pa a paper driven person, meaning, uh, and I've, I'm familiar with other governors, they, they preferred oral briefings, but he wanted to see it in writing and he, as, you, as Rick, you would know since you work for him too, you know, he would mark it up and he'd have his notes. And the famous TTM. TTM meaning talk, talk to, to me. me. <laughs> uh, or okay, or cross out meaning, you know, he wasn't interested. But, you know, that was, uh, he, he, he would, uh, that's how he spent his evenings, I think, was pouring over that material um, and then just, you know, move, moving forward. Probably the most uh, outward manifestation of the, that early going of the centralization of authority um, was the decision that was made to um, have only the state treasurer uh, testify before um, the legislature yeah. on mm -hmm. uh, uh, matters of, of, uh, of fiscal. I, I found this item. Asked up. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the Legislative Correspondence Club dinner in, yeah, uh, right, right. in, in uh, probably April or May of 1980, 1990. 
uh, all the members of the governor's staff wore this button that said Ask Doug, meaning, uh, do you have any questions for me? No, ask the treasurer. Um, whose idea was that? And, and uh, I mean, it was, it was certainly, it, it was unusual to that day, and it is unusual since that day. I don't mm -hmm. think any other governor has ever had only his treasurer uh, go before the legislature to answer questions about the budget. How was that decision made, and by whom? First of all, I don't know the precise answer to that question, but I can give you some context for it, and that is that the governor's approach to messaging, if you will, uh, I would say was uh, to be very disciplined about it, meaning that um, he wanted uh, on a given issue to limit the number of people who were authorized to formally or informally talk about a topic, right? So if it wasn't uh, him, uh, on a topic, it would be John Shore, uh, who's press uh, uh, communications director, I guess was his title, at the end press secretary, and, uh, and so anybody else who was so designated, right? So he didn't want a cacophony of voices, right? And it's interesting. Let me just interrupt you for a second because he—it sounds as though he did want a cacophony of voices uh, uh, inside, advising him. not outside, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And um, it was not. It was not a. It was not an administration where people uh, were loose lip with the press, if you will, or just, uh, you know, he didn't like that. He made that very clear to people. Uh, and he, he, he wanted to, you know, wanted to, con to make sure the message was disciplined. I think that's something he learned from his campaigns, that that's important to control the message of what you want to say to people. I think that, um, uh, so I, I suspect that actual decision was made between himself and, and Doug, uh, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if it was Governor Florio's decision, you may ask him if you haven't already, uh, rather than Doug's decision. Mm -hmm. I haven't asked him and, and, and would like to at some yeah, point. Right. Uh, but you were not actively involved then in that, in that decision? No, not at all. All right, what about the decisions now in terms of rolling out various initiatives? I mean, the first six months of the Florio administration were a whirlwind of activity. Mm -hmm. And a, a clear, calculated decision was made, um, I presume by, by the governor, that he was going to spend his political capital mm -hmm. in those first six months. You had the auto insurance um, reforms. You had uh, taking on the, the National Rifle Association over assault right. weapons. Uh, the uh, education financing uh, scheme, um, the uh, Clean Water Enforcement Act, and other, and, uh, the appointment of an environmental prosecutor, uh, and, cetera, and, and most prominently uh, the, <laughs> the budget and tax uh, mm -hmm. issues. Boom, 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 boom. And education financing. Uh, right. Well, the, those, I, I guess, really connected, do go yeah. hand in hand. Right, right. Um, it, it, obviously, a decision was made, as I said, to, to spend that political capital and do it. Right. Was that a unanimous decision among the Brain Trust? Were there differences of opinion about how rapidly or slowly these initiatives should come out? Yeah, there, there were some differences of opinion, but I, I think it's important to, again, for context here, Governor Florio is uh, a student of American political history, right? and he did get a master's degree at Columbia in that topic, and he, in studying other executives, uh, presidents and governors, um, he believed that uh, you have to use that, um, that mandate that you have, and he won by a substantial amount, uh, and he had a large majority in the legislature, to get those things done when you have the opportunity. Uh, and, I, and his reading of history is correct. I mean, that is, in fact, what if you look at what uh, other presidents, that's what President Roosevelt did. I mean, he got very little done in the, his third and fourth terms, uh, the part of his fourth term he, he survived. Um, uh, certainly, uh, Linda Johnson got very little done after the first couple of years and so on. So he was keen to get those things done. And he, um, unlike some other politicians, he believed that the role of being governor was to take on the issues. You know, Linda Johnson famously said uh, when they, he was told, don't push the Civil Rights Act, he said, what's a presidency for? And I believe that was Governor Florio's attitude as well. I have worked hard to get here. So I, why am I here if I don't do these things? And other people would say, and I'm not, I mean, that's their decision as, as a governor to decide how to lead. They may say, well, listen, I, I can't do everything once. I should wait, do a few things, husband my resources, and go on and do them later or 
maybe this is a better if I get reelected, the second term issue. But that was not his attitude. So I think some of the issues were presented to him that he felt he couldn't avoid, and others were those he chose to. And in the campaign, he had talked a great deal about insurance reform, uh, the environmental prosecutor, some of his other issues. And so he believed he needed to follow through. Um, the fiscal issue he hadn't talked about, and here you had this issue which was a deficit that needed to be dealt with, plus you had the looming um, uh, education finance issue. And the last thing I'd say is I believe he thought, uh, and many other governors had had this experience and other presidents, that if you have to do some tough stuff, you do it at the beginning. You don't wait. You do it at the beginning, and then you recover from the, uh, shall we say, the disappointment of the electorate with some of those issues that are unpopular. Did, did you or other folks in the front office uh, anticipate the, the level of antipathy that was going to result as a consequence of these initiatives? I would say, um, uh, again, this is, you know, with the, uh, the benefit of uh, 25 years of intervening uh, memory on my part, uh, the, the, perhaps the, the, less, the least well-estimated blowback was uh, the way in which the National Rifle Association organized to respond to the assault weapon ban and then linked it to the tax issue. So the, the, the so-called Hands Across New Jersey, I call it so-called, I mean, that was their name, but they were funded and organized by the National Rifle Association uh, to oppose the tax policy, right? The, the assault weapons ban was pretty popular. Obviously, taxes were not popular. Uh, and well, in fact, the assault weapons ban is the one that, that, that survived. It uh, did. Even, even when the, when the legislature shifted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 2013. Yeah, it, it, uh, but it was, uh, you know, they were, of course, vehemently opposed to that, and I went to countless meetings and understanding what an assault weapon is and not, according to them. Uh, so, and that was very, the legislature was very divided about doing that. Um, and it took an enormous effort to get them to do it, and Steve Persky and others were in the lead on that, not me. So, you know, but the, the blowback from that, the response to that, in my view was, let's put it this way, I didn't anticipate how successful they would be in mobilizing uh, against the governor in general. Uh, I don't know whether other people anticipated that. One of the um, underreported um, elements of the Quality Education Act mm. um, was the assumption by local school districts of the costs of teacher pensions, which uh, greatly angered the NJEA, which would have otherwise been presumably uh, a, a loyal union supporter of Jim Florio. Not only um, that, but the substantial additional money going to the schools from the state uh, in order to um, provide a better education for people. So under most circumstances, you would have certainly expected them to But that them. one element of that law yes. uh, cost Jim Florio the support of the teachers union, a very powerful force. And turned New them Jersey. against Democrats in the legislature, which then resulted in the repeal of the Quality Education Act mm -hmm. uh, by uh, the Democrats in a way to try to save their selves from a, a fate that they eventually encountered. It did so, not so, save itself so, from. <laughs> all right, so, so my question is, was that a mistake? I mean, from a political, from a purely political standpoint, um, had that piece of the QEA not been part of it, mm -hmm. uh, had you not taken on the teachers union, so to speak, in the same way that the NRA and auto insurers and others sort of lined up in opposition to the governor, might that have saved the day in the, in the midterm election? Uh, might it have saved the day in terms of the governor's ability to get reelected? Yeah, I suspect it. I suspect it would have made a difference. Um, I think that um, I think the governor was um, a bit surprised, perhaps, uh, by how strongly the union was attached to that particular provision. Um, that and they they made it very clear uh, that this was. Um, a deal killer for them that uh, um, that they um, would be against us if we went ahead with that, uh, and you know I think the governor felt that that was 
important in order to help control costs over time to put some more responsibility on the local districts to make these decisions uh, rather than on the state. Um, and that's, that's a view of governing and policy which is totally defensible, but it doesn't necessarily work out politically. Um, so, you know, I think it, it probably would have made a difference, but it would have, uh, you know, uh, it would have been a different policy. Now, the legislature, legislators, the leaders that I dealt with, uh, were divided about that. Um, some of them were more very worried about that and losing the support of the NEA, I'm sorry, the NJA, and others were, were less so. Um, but there was no question at that time, and I think it's less so as we talked in 2013, but in, in, at that time there was no question that the NJA was a very powerful political organization, not just for Democrats but for Republicans as well, uh, that they had an, a well-funded army of um, local uh, activists, uh, union presidents and union leaders, and that they were a very formidable, if not the most formidable organization in the state. One of the other criticisms um, of, the, uh, of the QEA in particular um, was that it was essentially trotted out in anticipation of the Abbott versus Burke decision coming down as opposed to waiting for the decision to come down and then coming up with a formula for correction. Um, which led to the belief uh, by a lot of people uh, that Governor Florio and the administration relished the opportunity to raise taxes uh, as opposed to being dragged kicking and screaming to have to raise mm -hmm. taxes. Uh, was that an accurate description of the governor's attitude and again in retrospect uh, would he have benefited from being appearing more reluctant mm -hmm. to do the things that uh, that he felt nece were necessary to be done. Well, I, I think it's important uh, to say, I would put it this way, um, he relished the opportunity to provide a better education for children in low-income districts. And I think that surprised some people because that wasn't a key topic in the campaign. Uh, it was a central part of his inaugural address. Uh, and it is a central part of who he was at the time, and I suspect still is, as a person who was deeply committed to that. I mean, he grew up um, in uh, New York and had a good education, was able to work his way into be the governor of the state of New Jersey um, after serving in the Navy. But education was his, op that was his opportunity and the ticket for him, and still is a lifting dream for millions and millions of people. He wanted to address that issue. Now, the second point is, from a timing standpoint, he wanted to do it in the first six months of his administration. Had he waited, uh, that wouldn't have happened, right? Uh, couldn't have happened. The court wasn't basing their decision, I don't think, uh, on that, um, although one never knows exactly what the court was doing. But the, I don't think there would have been enough time. So he, he wanted to move, a, move ahead on that. Uh, now, again, I think that it's also important to say, my view is, that the politics of this are never good when you raise taxes. I don't care how much uh, posturing you do to say you were kicking and dragging into this and so on and so forth. It's not going to be popular, right? Uh, so, and, it, and of course, again, the other thing to remember is there was a benefit to this, which was the intended benefit besides helping low-income children in these districts, but also to lower property taxes, which is the least popular uh, tax in New Jersey. So it's not like um, the, the governor was sitting there saying, well, how can I annoy people as many possible <laughs> ways as I can? There was a potential political benefit as well as a fiscal and, and, uh, and other benefit, an economic benefit from this policy change. So, um, but again, I, I've never met a politician who relished raising taxes, and I don't think he relished that. I think he, what he relished was wanting to address this issue, believing it needed to be addressed, believing the can had been kicked down the road for 20 years, and he was going to be the governor that would actually address it. Mm -hmm. And he did. Do you think that, um, that he, he approached this issue and several of these issues in a way that was significantly different from the way in which his predecessor had, had, had done it? Uh, I mean, I would use Tom Kane as an example of someone who, who, who 
did um, leave the impression of being dragged kicking and screaming to raise taxes uh, as part of a deal that was uh, done with a legislature of a different party, so that may have had, Key point. Had, uh, yeah, may have had an awful lot to do with it. Is it, and, and, and Governor Florio himself actually talks about the fact that the second two years of the administration, mm -hmm. um, when he faced veto-proof Republican majorities, that he actually was able to get quite a bit accomplished because of being able to make those deals with with the opposition party, um, was did did you feel that the the second two years? Well, you you had, you actually left. Um, I not, guess not the, until not until you know, the uh, not until the September of ninety two. So I was there in ninety two. So the, certainly the the first year of the of mm -hmm. dealing with the veto proof yes. uh, Republican majority. Did you find it easier in some ways to deal with them than uh, having to deal with members of your own or of the governor's own party in the previous two years? I, I don't think I'd put it that way because, I, I, again, the issues that were taken on in in the first six months and the first two years were much bigger and more, more difficult issues. So, um, you know, that, that they were just by nature, by their, their substance, going to be harder. Um, in the second two years, uh, the focus really turned much more towards um, trying to help the state economically recover from a recession, uh, which was, um, you know, obviously came on and uh, started officially, I think, in the late third quarter of 1990, I believe. But of course, we didn't know that until we got the GDP <laughs> numbers, gross domestic product numbers. Um, so, so the the issue of higher unemployment, trying to recover from that. Uh, and then dealing with um, the political fallout and a re-election and all those other things became more important. Um, and then dealing with the, the uh, attempt to repeal the assault weapons ban. But I, I don't think that they were, the second two years were as um, challenging because the mountains being climbed were, were not quite as high. Did you, from, after the first six months and with the emergence of hands across New Jersey and, and uh, um, demonstrations in front of the state house with toilet paper being thrown through the second story windows into your office and such. Um, did you feel besieged? Did you spend another uh, year or a year and a half in the front office feeling uh, just completely under siege and, and feeling as though everything that you had to do from that point on was to try and uh, um, get back the governor's capital? Was it, was, it, was it a siege mentality in the state house? I, did, I didn't feel under siege. I, I think that um, I think it, it were on the governor. I mean, it was very hard on him, you know, because you know he had taken on some issues that he felt strongly about, and he felt were very good on the merits. And of course, he was his reward for that was uh, a lot of attacks, um, either from people in his own party who said he'd made political mistakes, or from the public who were riled up about the tax increases. And again, remember, this is happening when the economy is declining, right? So, uh, and we see it today, um, at least in the last several years, when we have gone through the Great Recession, that people naturally lash out at their elected leaders when the economy is in bad shape, right? Because it's, their lives are miserable, and who do they turn to, right? They blame politicians. Uh, so I, I think that was very tough. Um, but I, I think that... Um, I certainly didn't feel under siege because I, I felt that there were many things that, um, and he did, that, that could still be accomplished, um, including the implementation of his policy changes, right, to make sure they worked out. And we should talk about that. But, but also um, other, other things he wanted to do that uh, were good for the state and, and certainly would be good for him as well politically. Um, so, uh, and the challenge of trying to deal with uh, writing the state from an economic problem, even though we know that we can't do it alone, but you can do what you can do, that was also very challenging. Uh, so I, I didn't feel that way. What major initiatives did um, survive the, the, the shift to Republican majority in the legislature, and how did implementation go? I guess auto insurance was one of them, which was not repealed. Mm -hmm. the, the environmental prosecutor was not repealed. Uh, his, his actions on education reform, even though it was, it was uh, peeled back somewhat, still 
the end of the day wound up putting much more money into, into those districts, right? Uh, the difference was some extra money was spread around to some other districts. Mm -hmm. But in fact, huge amounts of additional money went to those districts. Property taxes were declined for a couple of years, or a year and a half, I think. Um, and um, so, so all of those things, and the assault weapons ban, of course, was not repealed. So, so those things went forward. Um, and he also initiated a very large multi-department, multi-authority infrastructure spending program uh, using every opportunity for bonding authority and money from the Port Authority and, and so on and so forth to, uh, to do what you normally do when there's a recession, which is do counter-cyclical spending. Uh, on projects to try to both employ people and also bring some benefits to long-term benefits. Um, so th he did a lot of those things as well. So, you know, I, I think that um, a lot of it actually continued. And um, his, his focus, I think, on the, in the second, that second two years, w certainly moved more towards um, getting these projects and these things done, getting them implemented paying attention to them. And that's partly where the staff, I think, pivoted more towards that. Um, we also did welfare reform, which was, you know, I was not the central person. That was Brenda's, uh, Brenda, and of course the, uh, other people worked on that, and health care reform. So there were, there were other issues as well that went forward. The counter-cyclical funding, um, which of course has been much in the news the last couple of years, mm -hmm. um, was done with a Republican um, legislature in New Jersey. Is this a function of how much the Republican Party has changed uh, in the intervening 20 years? Because um, clearly President Obama trying to do precisely the same thing in Washington today is having no success whatsoever. I don't think the, I don't think state-based Republican parties are the same as the Washington-based Republican Party. So I think when you go around the country today, you find lots of Republican governors and Republican legislators who support these infrastructure spending. Um, and that was certainly true in New Jersey, and I think it's still true in New Jersey. So, um, so yeah, I think it's different. There's more of it as an ideological bent towards the Washington-based Republicans. Um, mm -hmm. But at any rate, um, there was, that, was a, that was a big uh, push on his part. And of course, he wanted to steer as much as he could into blighted urban communities where he thought there was an opportunity for uh, re rejuvenation, whether it was Newark or Patterson or Camden, which of course was very important to him, Atlantic City, um, and other smaller urban communities, including New Brunswick, where we're sitting today. So, um, and, and he, one of the other things to point out here is that I don't exactly remember when this happened, Somewhere along the line, the author there had been a separate unit overseeing the authorities, the 30-some authorities, in-state and by-state. That unit was abolished and transferred to me, to my responsibility. So I became responsible for making sure that not only those authorities were behaving ethically, legally, and, and so on, and, and of course the governor can veto the minutes of almost all of those authorities. So there was a review function but also a developmental function, which was to find resources to advance economic growth out of those authorities. Like selling a piece of the, of the of Interstate 95 to the New Jersey Turnpike Authority for $400 million. Or I think it was like 300 that. million, but it, whatever it was, it was, yeah. So, so that's right, um, widening the, the New Jersey Turnpike, um, using bonding authority, getting money from the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey to do various projects in the state. Um, in return for a toll hike. Mm -hmm. We also, we raised the tolls on the turnpike. And this is important too, uh, the, the, perhaps it's a context, but both tolls on the turnpike and the Port Authority were raised during his administration by a substantial amount without much blowback. Why? Because I think people, A, saw the direct benefit that was articulated, and secondly, there was so much other stuff going on, they probably were less concerned about that. But um, if you did that in isolation, nothing else was going on, people would probably be more outraged. But, but that's why those things were done. It was to, to get those projects going and to, um, you know, for example, there were projects built, the Atlantic City Convention Center was built out of that money. Um, there were numerous, you know, facilities that were constructed. 
uh, in, in part because he believed that, you know, he, he believed that these were ways to enrich the state in the long run, but also get people at work right now. And the construction industry was also in very bad shape uh, at that time because we were in a recession, not anything near like the one we experienced in the first decade of the 21st century, but it was, it was still a pretty serious one. Your um, statement about tolls just kicked in a thought that I had completely forgotten in 25 years. One of the things that Jim Florio mentioned when he was a candidate for governor mm -hmm. was that he was very much in favor of eliminating the tolls, I think specifically on the Garden State yes. Parkway. Right, right. I don't recall whether it was also the Turnpike, but no, I remember the, specifically you talked about, the park, about eliminating the parkway tolls and actually had a plan to do it. Right. Um, somehow that never, that never saw the light of day. Why not? I don't remember, but um, I do... Uh, I do remember that, I do say that unfortunately we didn't have the easy pass technology <laughs> that we have today which has allowed, uh, allowed us to um, you know, capture the same revenue and knock down some of the tolls, uh, toll barriers, <laughs> that would have been a nice thing. Mm. You left in September of 92. Mm -hmm. uh, was it always your intention to spend two or three years in government and then go back to academia? Had you? entered it with the express idea that sometime before the end of Governor Floria's first administration you would return to your academic Yeah, I life. suspect that I would. I, I had been there almost uh, in three years, you know, so I, I, the two days after the election, I, in November of 1989, I was working on the transition, and so almost three years goes to September of 92. Uh, and, um, you know, I was then uh, and still am a tenured professor at Rutgers University, and that's my home base. And I think that um, it was um, appropriate for me to return. And uh, and also, and, and by the way, the university had been very generous, I think, in allowing me that to do that, um, to give me a leave of absence, um, and to allow me to work for the state. So, I, the other thing that happened was uh, the. The, the university had created a, a new school, the Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. And I was asked by the then dean to be the chair of the public policy department um, and to put that together. So that was an exciting opportunity for me. And I was also asked to be an acting director of the Eagle Institute while Alan Rosenthal was on leave. And so, you know, and I, Eagleton uh, was my home at that time. So. I felt that that was really, given my long-term commitment to the university, that was what I should do. Now, I, when I told the governor I was doing this, uh, I met with him and I explained what I was going back, and he said, he pointed to the phone on his desk and he said, you're only as far away as my phone, because I will feel no inhibitions about calling you anytime I want. And I presume he followed through on that. And he did, <laughs> and I remained a, a part-time advisor to him through the rest of his term and worked on, you know, whatever duties as assigned, but it was certainly not, you know, it was probably a day a week, uh, let's say, if you put it all together, as opposed to seven and a half days a week, which is what it was like working for him. Was it a relief to go back to the quiet life of academia? You know, there's a, there's a decompression process you go through. I, I think that um, the working in that, in his administration and really working at a high level in any government, I think, it's like drinking water from a fire hose. And it is both <laughs> difficult and also stimulating, okay? Uh, and so, you know, I was uh, thrilled to have the opportunity, but there's no question that it's very stressful. Uh, it's stressful on your body, it's stressful. I mean, I was in my 40s, but I was stressed out, and I was in reasonably good physical condition. It's very stressful on your family. Um, so th there's no question, of course, it's more stressful on the governor because he can't leave. I mean, he's there. But I, I, think, it, I think it is stressful. So uh, I was very, I was happy to be back in the university because, you know, that's my life as an academic. Um, I mean, one of the things I, I missed was writing. You know, I'm a writer, and you know, I'd spent my whole life writing, and I, most of what I did in government was talk and meet with people and read other people's writing, uh, and wrote things very short things. But you know, I, I was used to writing much longer things. And yeah, memos aren't exactly the same as books, are they? No, <laughs> and and doing scholarly work, and and I think, 
The other thing is that the university um, is a place where some people complain about it, but essentially most of your life in a university is dealing with other smart people whose motivations are the same as yours. They want to learn things. They want to help young people. And it's really a pretty pleasant place to be. Um, politics in Trenton is not something I would describe in that same way. Uh, and um, it's not that I was unprepared for that. I mean, I did, I, I was a steel worker when I was a young man, so it's not like I'd never been in a tough environment. But, you know, it's, it's not the same as university. So I really enjoy being back with my colleagues, people who um, tend most of the time to tell you the truth and really are well motivated. So, okay. so you wouldn't agree with Henry Kissinger's assessment that academic politics are so nasty because the stakes are so low. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 there are such things, but I, I don't think that's a, that's, that's a silly characterization. I mean, after all, look, you, you, you don't, very seldom as a professor do you do any harm. You know, you're helping people, you're helping young people achieve what they want to do. You're writing things that you're interested in, you know, so it's, it's a different life. But, but again, having said that, I, um, I was grateful for the opportunity. I think I made some contributions. I admired the governor then, I still do. Because, you know, my feeling, my experience with him was he, he always wanted to do the right thing. He may have made judgments that in retrospect people didn't like and he made other judgments they did like, but I know his, I know his motivation was such that um, he wanted to do the best thing he could for the state of New Jersey and he threw himself into that. And, it, and, it's, and I, I enjoyed his trust uh, and that is really what matters when you're working for an elected official. Um, there, there were certainly things I, tasks I undertook that were unpleasant, that is to say for some people they didn't like the decisions that were being made, and he always backed me 100% whenever people would complain because I was actually carrying out his decision. <laughs> Unlike some other politicians who might blame their staff for a mistake, he never did that because he, he, it was his decision. and he. He always, you know, there were certain labor leaders and business leaders who might complain about what I was doing, but they were actually his decisions. And so he never said, well, that Van Orn guy. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, and that's very important, you know, that, that you have that trust because then, then you're willing to go out there and do your level best because you know you're going to be supported. And that's what he did. From the vantage point of uh, 20 years of hindsight, um, is there anything you would point to that was particularly unique about? Jim Florio was governor. Uh, Brendan Byrne is fond of saying, for example, that, um, that had he not decided to, to save the Pine Barrens, yeah. just one day, boom, made that decision, that he's not sure that anybody else would have done it. Are there things or anything in particular that you can point to in Jim Florio's term as governor that uh, were unique to him that, uh, that you think no other person would have done? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that's possible to make that uh, kind of judgment because, you know, no other person. Uh, I, I think what he did do was he had a very clear agenda about what he wanted to do, how he thought he was going to make the state better. Uh, and he pushed forward a lot of those things and, and had a lot of achievements. Would somebody else have done that as fast? Uh, uh, probably not because he was very ambitious about those, but perhaps some other people would have. Uh, I don't think Congressman Quarter would have. I mean, that was that was his opponent, so we have a clear chance to, to make a comparison there. But um, you know, I, I think his commitment to education, finance reform, you know, because by the, it was very central. Because by the time he was done, finished his governorship, the the gap between rich and poor districts had already been cut in half from when he started. You know, so and it eventually it's closed even further, obviously, twenty some years later. But that was the great leap forward in terms of, of uh, addressing those issues. And as many other people can speak to this, the, uh, the educational performance uh, in those districts improved enormously. Uh, those young, so that's a whole generation, if you will, of young people growing up doing better, not all of them, but many of them doing better, getting better education, going on to more successful lives. So, um, you know, I think he can clearly point with pride to that. Would somebody else have done that? I don't know. No one had done that <laughs> prior to his election because uh, it's a very difficult issue. Carl Van Horn, thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy being with you.